Section 1 of Technocracy by William Henry Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project Technocracy, Part 1 Human Instincts and Reconstruction An Analysis of Urges and the Suggestion for Their Direction Editor's Note the author shows that the forces of the four great human instincts, to live, to make, to take, to control, are as essential in modern social life as at any time in the past. But all of these urges in a living democracy should be controlled, without being controlled. To achieve this seeming paradox, we must have a great national purpose and unselfish leadership, such as could come through a national council of scientists. Mr. William Henry Smith has been in general practice as a consulting engineer since 1879. He is the inventor of many machines and mechanical devices, including a system of raising water by direct explosion on its surface, the device being known as the direct explosion pump. He has been an engineering expert in many patent cases, and is a frequent contributor to technical journals. As well as a pioneer in mechanics, Mr. Smith is a pioneer in economics. He is a member of the leading scholarly associations in that field, including the American Economic Association and the Royal Economic Society of Great Britain. Parts 1, 2, and 3 appeared originally in Industrial Management of New York. The concluding Part 4 has not heretofore been published, and will appear exclusively in the Gazette. The Editor Instincts Control Instincts are the most persistent human urge factors. Seemingly, they are less subject to change than even the most unchanging aspects of our physical environment. The instinct to live, self-preservation, is as dominating today as in the days of our caveman ancestors. The instinct to construct is as persistent in man as in the beaver. The mastery instinct, desire to control others, is as vital as ever. The thievish instinct, desire to acquire and hoard, shows no change, and is the same old urge as that disclosed by the pre-man stores of insects, birds, and various animals. Indeed, without these primordial urges, man could not have developed, and the loss or atrophy of any one of them would probably mean the rapid extinction of the race. Thus it would seem, that our fundamental instincts are essentially necessary to human continuance, at least to our social existence. So let us look once more at these vital factors, in the light of recent events, in order to see what part they now take, and are likely to play, in our future social economy. Brute Force No lesson of the war, probably, is more obvious or more clearly defined, than the rapid trend towards skill as a predominating and controlling factor, in our immediate social development. Recorded history and archaeological investigation, confirm the suggestion, that in the matter of economic control of human activities and their products, the possession of this control has oscillated to and fro, under the influence of one or other of the instinctive urges, so that characteristic types of men secured alternate mastery. Starting in the pre-human period, before the dawn of definite self-consciousness, and continuing during the eons in the twilight of human intelligence, raw brute force must have been the dominating economic factor. The influence of skill during this period was practically negligible, except in so far as it affected individuals. Of this the huge prolongation of the unchanging Stone Age is sufficient demonstration. Contest with Cunning The gradual growth and rapid culmination of the skill factor is an important consideration in our present inquiry, and likewise in our social reconstruction problems. For while purposeful skill is of slow development, purposive cunning, on the contrary, is inherently otherwise. Indeed, Cunning and purposiveness both imply mental alertness, and hence are in some wise synonymous. For these reasons, in the early stages of human development, raw strength and animal cunning must alone have contended to satisfy the other instinctive urges, to live, to control, practically uninfluenced by the relatively modern urge of purposeful skill. Doubtless this simple conflict, of raw strength and brute cunning, waged with varying results, slowly oscillating, age by age and race by race, in favor of one or other human type as environmental conditions or racial admixtures, gave one or other the advantage of circumstance. And, as economics implies, 
the usages, laws, and institutions, whereby a community endeavors to organize its methods and means of living, those whose activities characterize the times, initiate and administer its economics. Age-long seesaw So, with these age-long oscillations of control types, economic institutions necessarily underwent like changes, conforming to the dominating human characteristics of each age and nation. That they did so oscillate and economically conform, in the vaguest dawn of human beginnings, is the teaching of archaeology. During the past few thousand years, the contest of strength and cunning is shown by reliable historical records to have oscillated with comparative rapidity between one and the other extreme, including considerable periods during which strength and cunning unified control by union of church and state. Prior to the immediate present was a transition stage, caused by the gradual weakening of the bond between church and state, with a coincidental shifting of control in favor of cunning, under a changed and relatively modern guise, representing the instinct of urge to take, expressing itself as commercialism. With this change came a consequent modification of usages, laws, and institutions, appropriate to its highest expression, capitalism, capitalistic economies. The result of this last oscillation of control in favor of acquisitive cunning was that Germany became a nation of slaves, England a nation of paupers, France quit breeding, and the United States went wealth crazy. Challenge by purposive skill. The war represents the conclusive termination, in this period, of the age long contest of force and cunning, for the control of men and the products of their activity. But this last and most spectacular conflict is complicated by the intrusion of the most modern and most rapidly developing factor, organized purposive skill. Here, then, skill enters the arena with a challenge to both earlier contestants for the prize of human control and mastery of the social machinery, enters that contest, older than the race itself, the struggle to satisfy the primordial instincts, to live, to control, to take. Strength versus cunning versus skill. Thus the contest has become a triangular fight between the strong, the cunning, and the skillful, a fight in which raw brute force is a participant of rapidly diminishing importance, a modified continuation of the old-time bloody contest for a humanly undesirable outcome. Cunning control is today the victor, and in possession of the spoils, the financial wealth of the world. But all the evidence points to a short enjoyment and a losing fight against the organized forces of purposive skill. Creaking Capitalism Cracking Capitalism, under war stress, shows convincing evidence of inadequacy. The non-effectiveness of money and credit wealth has become so obvious as to procure the enactment of work or fight laws. Thus, into the discard went our pre-war money evaluation of men, to be substituted by a standard which measures millionaire and hobo alike, in accordance with their relative skill. Our pre-war faith in the mysterious magic of money, too, received a staggering shock, when all the private fortunes and mast and all the billions of national credit combined, utterly failed to add a single pound of much-needed sugar to our limited supply, necessitating the two pounds of sugar per person apportionment, a commonplace vulgar fraction measure, applicable to financial potentate and wary willy alike. Producer versus Parasite On broader lines also the evidence points the same way. Purposive skill is inherently productive, while purposeful cunning is naturally parasitic. Then the capability of cunning to rule, and the continuance of its success in controlling others, resides in and depends upon the stupidity and illiteracy of the governed. Mystery and magic are its weapons, equally in the realm of modern finance as in the ancient theocracies. Skill implies the reverse of all this, for skill is intelligence physically manifested. It is knowledge of nature's laws utilized dexterously, and the spread of scientific information characterizes our age. Thus, as the bulwarks of cunning control crumble, the weapons of skill are multiplied and perfected. So the outcome seems a foregone conclusion. With this outcome, our methods of life will necessarily change. Capitalistic customs, laws, and institutions will be substituted by others differing as widely from those with which we are familiar, as the motor ideas and ideals of purposeful cunning differ from those of purposeful skill. Work or Fight Lesson Peradventure, 
the work or fight, and the two pounds of sugar per person measures, are tonic forecasts of the coming skill economics. Obviously we are in transition to a new social order. The signs of the times portend the dethroning of decadent acquisitive capitalism and the crowning of productive skill, autocrat of the new age, artisanism. This change has been in dubious process for years. The war has merely speeded its progress and made the outcome practically inevitable. But, whether it be brought about by evolution or revolution, or whether it comes in clean-cut aspect, or be fogged by irrelevant social factors and forces, it is in no sense a rational or final solution of our social problem. In any event, should artisanism come, it will be merely another social spasm, probably shorter than, but equally as futile as, our present worldwide finance madness. Instincts not a rational basis. While it is conceivable that human societies could be organized upon, and with, any one of the stated basic instincts as dominant factor and raison d'etre, it is practically certain that any such national society would be quite ineffective and transient. For obviously it would not, and could not satisfy even our present limited intelligence, our rational imagination, or our modern spiritual ideals. No very extended analysis would be required to show the validity of this proposition. The past has already demonstrated the insufficiency of societies based upon the mastery instinct, autocracy. The present amply proves the failure of the acquisitive instinct as a social basis, plutocracy. A moment's thought will show that a society based upon the making instinct would simply crumble in its formative process, under the demands of our complicated modern mental makeup, for clearly this instinct provides inadequate human scope and hence presupposes parasitism in even more extended form than that of acquisitive capitalism. And, worse than all, a society based upon the instinct to live and propagate would return us at once to the brute state from which we have arisen through ages of struggle, strife, and bloodshed. Control without control Still, it is apparent that the basic instincts which urge to live, to make, to take, to control, are as useful, yes, are as essential in and to modern social life, as they have been in all the past. But while all are necessary, no one of them constitutes a proper basis, law of operation, for a rational human society organization. They are factors, necessary and desirable contributory parts, no one of which is inherently adapted to function as the machine's unifier, its strain and speed equalizer, its control element. Thus, the determination of a suitable character of control element is seemingly the crux of our social problem, the problem of controlling without control, that old, old paradox, freedom made effective by restraint, a paradox, however, which the war may have resolved for us by demonstrating its non-existence. It has, in some wise, answered our troublous question by clear definition in the statement of the nation's object in going to war. The war has answered the question, in another aspect, by the nation's adoption of the method, forced upon it by logical compulsion, whereby success was achieved. To make the world safe for democracy is the clearest and most universally accepted statement of our purpose in going to war, self-government for nations, self-government for individuals. Concept of Control Control by others, then, is antithetical to the ideals for which we have waged this last, the greatest, and, it is hoped, the final bloody contest for self-government. Control is equally antithetical to our ideals of self-government, whether the control is exercised by others, characterized by the instinct to live and breed, the masses, or whether the control is exercised by others, characterized by the instinct to make, the skilled artisan, or whether the control is exercised by others urged by the instinct of mastery, the employers, or whether the control is exercised by others, under their dominating acquisitive instinct, the financiers. Indeed, the concept, control by others, is an idea inherent in and appropriate only to now discredited autocracy, a concept which the war has rendered an obsolete ideal, if we are intelligent enough to profit by its costly teaching. Discard Caveman Control To be rationally consistent, this control concept should be as absent as it is obsolete, in fact and effect, in our inevitable reconstruction. 
this autocracy control concept must be thrown in the discard where we have dumped the european autocrats whose ideal it was if our reconstruction efforts are intended to produce a rationally organized modern human society a society founded upon the ideals consecrated by the lifeblood of our bravest and best but our age-long familiarity with control by others in our halting progress from brute beast to modern man has so deeply ingrained in our mental fibre this stone age concept as to make it almost impossible for us to even conceive the idea of a society lacking this caveman spiked club element yet no fact and lesson of our participation in the war is more clear and free from doubt than the spontaneous acquiescence by the people of the united states rich and poor artisan and laborer alike in self-control self-repression self-dedication to the united will and unified purpose of the nation purpose no lesson of the war is more significant than given a national purpose intelligently comprehended and acquiesced in only unselfish leadership is needed and neither control by force nor control by cunning is necessary to bring about the unification of effort needed to accomplish the nation's objective the significance of this lesson is the utter irrationality of national control in the hands of any class characterized by self-centered instincts or that strength or skill or cunning should be dominating factors in the social structure though none of these factors should dominate each and all of these vital and necessary elements should have free scope for the socially effective outflow of its particular expression of life energy second only in significance to the acquiescence and cooperation of the united people is the method irresistibly forced upon the nation by the logic and necessities of its stupendous war problem first real nation this first modern economic institution and the united cooperation of the united people are the two outstanding lessons of the war for us taken together they point significantly to the solution of our social problem the lacking element which should and could consciously deliberately and rationally unify the basic instinctive urges into an harmonious direction of national effort and so produce a humanly efficient national organization the first real nation on earth the lacking element the element which is adapted to assume the function and position to be vacated by the obsolescent autocratic concept arbitrary control the element capable of controlling without control of making freedom effective democracy a living fact as well as a noble ideal in this as in many other seemingly difficult problems of long standing the solution has evaded us by reason of its very obviousness such a unifying factor has always existed in plain view unutilized in its proper function as social strain equalizer indeed this urge factor more even than the instincts to live to make to take to control is the most universal and most humanly characterizing trait of that most marvelous complex man desire to know i refer to curiosity curiosity rationalized into desire to know desire to know while equally urgent for gratification inherently lacks the undesirable and inappropriate qualities which render the other human instincts unsuitable as organizing and strain equalizing factors in the social structure also it possesses qualities and attributes which make it peculiarly adapted to perform the rationally harmonizing function so irrationally assumed in all earlier social organizations under the guise of forceful and cunning control desire to know is as imperative in its demands as any of the self-centered motor instincts to live to make to take to control but it is impersonal while it is as aggressive as other instinctive urges characteristically its natures and activities are directed at nature not in aggression on human opponents hence it engenders no human strife and while it drives furiously it drives none but its possessor in the pursuit of knowledge desire to know while profoundly interested in all that pertains to human life and living to eugenics and racial development characteristically its possessor would risk his own life in the pursuit of knowledge desire to know though urgently interested in nature's laws and in all that concerns the correct making and constructing of things characteristically lacks desire to make or construct things but seeks only systematized concepts of knowledge desire to know while deeply interested in all that pertains to the desirable things of the world and to economic affairs 
characteristically lacks the thievish impulse, the instinct to take, to acquire physical possession, supremely acquisitive, it craves only to acquire knowledge. Desire to know, while surpassingly masterful, desires no mastery of men, it craves instead, godlike insight, prevision, prophecy, power in the boundless realms of knowledge. Leadership here then is an indomitable urge lacking all the inappropriate qualities of the strife-producing autocratic force and fear control motor concept of social organization and possessed of all the unifying qualities of social leadership a human society or nation is sanely designed or rationally organized on correct principles only when it has a purpose and as in the case of a well-considered machine only when full cognizance is taken of all its contributory elements together with their essential functions and their proper coordination a national objective a truly efficient national organization would facilitate not suppress or prohibit the expression of all inherent instinctive urges rationalizing their outflowing life energy by sane institutional conventions into unification in a fully predetermined national purpose in a crude but clearly perceptible manner the united states during the war gave suggestion of such an ideal social arrangement. It had a defined and universally accepted purpose. Its scientific desire to know, men and its scientific societies were, more or less, organized into a unifying and advisory board to formulate and suggest methods and means for sane living, and to accomplish the predetermined purpose of the nation. We have accomplished the object of the war. We have made the world safe for democracy now let us inaugurate a democracy a democracy with an object for its existence a democracy with a purpose by the peril to its life the nation has been shocked into momentary sanity let us while still rational rationally take to heart the lessons which the war has taught at so staggering a cost first the need of a national purpose a purpose based upon peace and rational human development a purpose as inspiring and as unifying as war for democracy, and as high as our highest ideals of life. Second, the need of a supreme national council of scientists, supreme over all other national institutions, to advise and instruct us how best to live, and how most efficiently to realize our individual and our national purpose and ideals. But first and last, a unifying national objective. Fernwald, Berkeley, December. 1918. Is it rational to base human society on animal instincts? End of Technocracy, Section 1. Section 2 of Technocracy by William Henry Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Technocracy. Part 2. National Industrial Management. Practical Suggestions for National Reconstruction. Editor's Note. After outlining and characterizing the great economic drifts in the national developments of the past, the author declares that during the period of the war, the United States has developed the new form in government, for which there is no precedent in human experience. He calls this technocracy, the organizing, coordinating, and directing, through industrial management on a nationwide scale, of the scientific knowledge and practical skill of all the people who could contribute to the accomplishment of a great national purpose. Carry this new form of government into the ways of peace, and we will have industrial democracy, a new commonwealth. The Editor Economic Drifts The United States is obviously in social flux, in unstable economic equilibrium, in transition. Customs and usages which a few years ago received universal approval and legal sanction are now punished as crimes. Economic expedients which but yesterday were deemed irrational imaginations of utopian visionaries are today accomplished facts. And, in every direction, immemorial methods and time-honored social processes have lost their sacrosanctity. Like ocean streams enfolding in mass flow, all this whirling confusion of economic cross-currents legal revolutions, and social agitations, there are to be observed certain super-controlling drifts. Centralization of government, concentration of wealth, unification of mechanical industries. 
force, wealth, industry. These great economic drifts indicate the mass resultant of myriad individual activities expressing that peculiarly human quality, which has made man the dominating animal factor on earth, unquenchable desire to control, the mastery instinct. And what is more important in the present connection, these super-controlling social drifts also indicate the only directions possible for the social expression of the indomitable human urge. Direct control of men by force and fear, exemplified in centralization of government. Indirect control of men by controlling their products, shown in concentration of wealth. Mutualized control, i.e. utilization, of nature, expressed in unification of mechanistic industries. Conflicting ideals. In these various forms of social aggregations there are, broadly speaking, but three human types involved. The type characterized by aggressive physical strength. The type characterized by alert mental cunning. The type characterized by purposive skill. Of these the last, the purposive skill type, is significantly modern, brought into social prominence by that most stupendous social factor, experimental science, science which is the effective cause and basis of this era of invention, our industrial age. A triangular conflict of ideals of life and of social purpose has thus been inaugurated, a conflict which accounts for, and is expressed in, our social unrest, conflict of capital and labor, our social problem, and reconstruction. The strife for supremacy of social ideal and community purpose thus indicated is coextensive with the human race, its most spectacular climax is the world war. And, notwithstanding the many confusing forms and many-sided aspects which this worldwide human struggle presents, it is, of course, at bottom the ages-old contest of slavery and liberty, bondage and freedom. The Golden Age Our answer to this old but ever new problem will determine whether our industrial age will progress to a social condition of industrial freedom to which nothing in the past is comparable, or whether our time shall be, to future generations, the golden age, the high-water mark of human liberty, the age of a noble but a futile fight for a great ideal, democracy. Club Economics In simple caveman times the boss parent, quite naturally, made and administered suitable primitive economics with his persuasive club as a very practical emblem of authority under this raw force regime the weaker fagged for the stronger and the doings and havings of the fags made life more likable for the forceful as the procreator of his subjects and superior in strength during most of their lives the ownership of them and theirs by the boss parent was as natural as any other obvious fact and chattel slavery as necessary as parent ownership is self-evident. Mystery Economics Then, Miracle Fire Maker and Animal Breeder came along, and disturbed many of the time-honored and well-established customs, playing havoc generally with club economics. By his wonder-working magics, cunning miracle worker put the fear of gods, more potent than physical strength, into the heart of simple old skullcracker parent god, so miracle worker waxed fat, and in his turn initiated and administered suitable economics, fire worship and mystery economics, otherwise theocracy. With theocracy came the greatest of all social revolutions, the dethroning of brute strength, and the crowning of mental alertness, cunning. This marked an epoch in human history, in man's upward progress as a social animal. Also it marked the beginning of control of men, and their products through man's instinctive fear of the unknown, the rule of the cunning. Force Mystery Economics With varying fortunes, force economics and cunning economics contended for supremacy, till in comparatively modern times autocracy was found an effective compromise. In this most practical arrangement, the by that time conventionalized parent god received his authority from the all-powerful god of magic so was initiated modernized force mystery economics. And the human race has yet found no more efficient means for the control of organized society than force mystery economics, methods, means, and institutions which, but superficially modified since old miracle workers' day, still function in our twentieth-century customs, autocratic and democratic, usages, conventions, and legalized economic systems. Working by Proxy Economics 
in caveman economics the real function of the club or the purpose of clubber was not to incapacitate club e but to induce the latter to do and supply the matters and things which otherwise would require greater and more constant expenditure of effort on the part of the economist than the semi-occasional swing of his skull-cracker old skull-cracker's motives though more crudely expressed were the same as mine are in the employment of my cook and my gardener that is economy of effort on my part otherwise working by proxy but the club economic system was essentially wasteful and inefficient its operating expenses were outrageously high notwithstanding the low cost of raw human material indeed the system was apt to defeat its own ends especially in those strenuous days when zeal commonly outran discretion doers and suppliers thus mystery coercion represents an enormous economic advance over raw physical force fear of unknown but awesome consequences for failure to do and supply matters and things is fully as effective as the club and beyond measure less wasteful of doers and suppliers so it is quite natural and inevitable that crude force methods and processes of economic control should lose favor in competition with mystery economic systems and long race experience has proved that a judicious combination of club and mystery otherwise force and cunning makes for the highest degree of efficiency in a working by proxy economic system proxy beneficiaries such economic systems however obviously imply direct or indirect slavery ownership of the body or control of the mind of the proxy and for the latter the mystery method is peculiarly adapted and most satisfactory for self-evident reasons control over another's mind is more effective and economical than property ownership of his body taking into consideration the practical responsibility which the latter entails so quite naturally direct ownership of proxy by the economical worker by proxy gives place to customs usages and conventions economics facilitating control over the results of proxy's activities then too complex division of labor and specialization render chattel slavery impractical indeed unworkable in a society highly organized for productive industry so an ideal working by proxy economic system would permit complete physical liberty to do and to make while arranging appropriate usages customs and laws which automatically transfer ownership of the matters and things done and made from the doers and makers to the proxy beneficiaries economic science the difference between modern and primordial economics is not in idea or purpose but only in added obscurity of method and in greater complexity of detail incidentally also it has become evident that economics is not a science in any proper sense but a variable system of community usages intended to facilitate the predominating social activities and hence to be workable an economic system must be in keeping with the activities which characterize the times in caveman times the boss parent and his club men had to make cave economics a system initiated by the fags would have been obviously unworkable the priesthood had to initiate and administer theocratic economies and so on through the various changes in social organization those whose activities characterize the times must initiate and administer its economics economic experiments raw force has been relegated to the economic backwoods to the racially infantile tribes of darkest africa and to the social usages of our anachronistic criminal elements the yeg the thug the gunfighter the strong-arm gangs of the underworld of modern organized society theocracy with its crude cunning its childish terrors and its dazzling promises of future supermundane rewards has practically vanished as a recognized dominant social factor a fading shadow of ancient greatness autocracy that cunning combination of force and fear economics has just now been dumped into the scrap heap of outworn social expedients at the cost of the most atrocious and bloodiest of all wars and the flower of the world's manhood plutocracy with its autocratic capitalistic economics while weakened and shaken by the shocks and stresses of the world war is still a virile contestant for the throne of world domination strength skill cunning economics efficient for autocracy 
must necessarily differ from economics appropriate for theocracy and these would differ from economics suitable for plutocracy and these again would differ still more from economics appropriate to and efficient for industrial democracy in brief force economics cunning economics and skill economics must necessarily differ as widely as the essential differences between the basic qualities strength cunning skill hence any attempt to organize or reconstruct a social aggregation with these three basic human traits as contemporary economic bases means simply continual social warfare a war which sooner or later must be decided by victory for the strong the cunning or the skilled unless human ingenuity can devise a form of society which will permit and facilitate the full unified and socially useful expression of these three irrepressible forms of life energy mechanized industry thus we return to the three great social drifts centralization of government concentration of wealth unification of mechanistic industries of the first two little need be said for they are familiar racial experiences but the last the mechanizing of life is quite otherwise hence it is if for no other reason the most significant factor to be taken into account in the social problems with which we are now confronted our problem of economic reconstruction and truly our modern mechanization of human life is a most dubious social experiment a danger fraught development a dynamitic racial adventure modern science back of the mechanizing of human functioning is that greatest of all modern marvels experimental science science has brought about a profound revolution in our mental attitude toward life and in our methods of dealing with nature it has swept into the discard practically all our previous notions regarding ourselves and our relations to the laws of nature to universal reality it has at the same time debased man's pride in the dust of humility and glorified intelligence and human worth to godlike heights science is of course the effective cause of our present mechanistic development with all its physical benefits and all its spiritual horrors for science knows neither morals nor ethics and is equally potent for social bad as for social good science works just as effectively in criminal hands as in those of a saint it is an impersonal ethically neutral force and factor so potent that even in the chaotic condition in which it now exists it has brought about a world revolution in man's mental outlook and his physical activities both individually and collectively indeed it has shown to man a new heaven a new earth and a new hell our social heaven we have yet to construct but the world war is sufficiently impressive proof of what social hell can be wrought by science in the hands of self-interest there is no serenity a long view on the part of science which seems to be of no age but to carry human thought along from generation to generation freed from the elements of passion every just mind must condemn those who so debase the studies of men in science as to use them against humanity and therefore it is part of your task and of ours to reclaim science from this disgrace to show that she is devoted to the advancement and interest in humanity and not to its embarrassment and destruction the spirit of science is a spirit of seeking after truth so far as the truth is ready to be applied to human circumstances from president wilson's address before the academy of Linksy in rome past and present as the result of modern science the present time is without precedent hence no valid analogy exists or can be imagined between an economic system appropriate to our science-taught mechanistic age and earlier economic systems suitable to conditions of life the warp woof and pattern of which were mystery magic chance that no helpful comparison can be made between the past and the present would be completely true were it not that our science teachings affect but the thinnest superficial layer of our conscious thinking while the fabric of our thought processes our familiar customs our current usages our economic institutions remain practically unchanged our racial heritage but even so the unceasing conflict of past and present of slavery and freedom of bondage and liberty of error and truth goes ever on and on a blood-soaked path a path of misery strife and disappointment though hopefully ever upward toward our ideal 
industrial democracy with personal freedom for self-realization mental inertia without a concurrent change of economic institutions appropriate to the amazingly rapid psychical development and refinement of our modern ideals brought about by the advent of science the realization of these ideals will be impossible and sorrowfully we recognize that man's instinctive resistance to change of old established modes of thought howsoever irrational makes progress in this direction seem almost hopeless familiar fallacies most reluctantly are familiar fallacies relinquished indeed we hang on to them with irrational tenacity ages after their unworkable character has time and again been tragically demonstrated as in our bodily functions and skeletal frame there still persist the characteristics of our saurian primordial ancestry so ancient modes of thought live unnoted in our present-day thinking processes and our social institutions represent the seemingly outgrown superstitions constituting man's mental heredity during every past age since the infancy of the human race got mit uns medievalism characterizes our sacred and secular institutions and energizes our customary actions demonology is practically as prevalent as in the past unnoted in ourselves but easily perceived in the got mit uns attitude of the kaiser we pray for health heedless of nature's laws we pray for long life while disregarding the simple rules of right living we beseech forgiveness of sin while making sin profitable by deliberate legal enactment in a world filled to overflowing with all good and humanly desirable things to be had for the striving we economically steal from our industrious neighbors like paupers we beg god for vicariously earned joys for unearned prosperity and for all other forms of undeserved good fortune and like pert children we urge silly advice on our man-made providence for the conduct of common human affairs which we are too lazy too stupid too self-indulgent to bring to desired outcome by our own effort the god of chance important departments of life and the distribution of the products of industry trade speculation opportunity recreation involve large elements of luck for by the grotesquely solemn laws the issues are left to the god of chance just precisely as in the old days when momentous matters were settled by the entrails of sacrificial animals the killing of president mckinley by a madman caused a depreciation in the value of stocks to the extent of thousands of millions of dollars the san francisco calamity which rendered half a million human beings homeless made fortunes for the owners of and speculators in suburban property the titanic disaster threw a hundred millions of wealth others products into the hands of a schoolboy and with it control over the lives of thousands of human beings and even the supreme tragedy of a world at war is the prolific cause of transforming hundreds of mediocre men into multi-millionaires and hence into powerful social factors diabolism all this represents kindergarten thinking primitive and childish as nursery prattle of prixies and fairies aladdin's lamp and all the other forms of old world superstition and diabolism worthy only of the infancy of the race were it not that these grotesqueries characterize our economic and finance system and our solemn professors soberly teach them they would be utterly incredible in this age of science and mechanics but as already indicated our economics and finance are merely survivals from pre-science times an inheritance from the days of wizardry and witchcraft mystery and magic our quaint economics and clear finance are as anachronistic as inconsistent and as ineffective in this mechanical age of industrialism as astrology would be in an astronomical observatory alchemy in a chemical laboratory or perpetual motion in a machine shop scientific foresight imagination based on science enables us to foresee the oak in the acorn coming events latent in present happenings but so strong is custom so firm is the grip of the past so compelling is the obsession with ancient superstitions that with all our lately acquired capability for rational scientific thinking only the tragedy of the accomplished fact has sufficient power to jolt our sluggard wits into momentary activity ten fifteen yes twenty-five years ago it required no more intelligence to foresee the present war than to anticipate a crop in the fall from seed sown in the spring even less scientific information is now needed to foretell a condition of social disintegration 
one more widespread and disastrous than the war, as the logical and inevitable outcome of our irrational and antiquated social conventions, our economic financial system. Taking Instinct If taking, by force or diverting by cunning, in whole or in part, the product of another's effort, without adequate equitable return, be accepted as a valid social principle of action between individuals, it must be equally good and proper as between social groups, as between nations. But however disguised in smooth-sounding phrases, the chances of business, the profits of trade, the opportunity of others' misfortune, the prize of the victor, the fortunes of war, the right of might, taking expresses the parasitic and predatory instincts. And called by whatsoever name or howsoever disguised, taking others' makings by force, or diverting others' products by stealthy cunning, inevitably involves unending strife, strife within the group and recurring wars of nations, strife to settle the relative strength or cunning as between individuals, and wars to determine the relative might of nations. Predatory Economics Our economic system is essentially autocratic in means, in method, in objective. Being left over from an age of predatory autocracy, necessarily its ideals are materialistic, its motor instinct and urge impulse being self-centered greed and grab. Naturally its means are force and cunning and its methods are ruthless, for its object is power. Power, irresponsible and absolute. Our Modern Ideals If we are to remain true to our ideals, ideals which the flame of war has illuminated to our normally purblind spiritual insight, our course is determined. We have no choice but to choose freedom, pioneer a virgin trail, slash a course unblazed by history, uncharted in race experience, a courage-testing national adventure. The race has never before been confronted with the situation in any way analogous to the one in which we now find ourselves, nor a problem the like of that which we are now compelled to solve, yes, and solve correctly, if we would avoid disintegration into social chaos, overwhelmed by a science-made Frankenstein. Science is dynamitic. Science has, however, put into our hands an instrumentality of such immeasurable potency that, used with intelligent courage, we may conquer all our difficulties, surmount all our social obstructions. But science left to chance, or in the hands of unintelligent self-interest, the chances are it will work untold social calamity. There are so many roads to go wrong, and only one way to go right. To leave a force and factor, of such supreme social significance and potentiality as science, in its present condition, socially uncontrolled and unorganized for the commonweal, is more crassly unintelligent than to permit fused and capped dynamite to be scattered around promiscuously, to the chances of any carelessly or maliciously applied spark. A striking and significant parallelism to the thought here expressed was subsequently voiced by President Wilson in one of his speeches at the Versailles Peace Conference. Is it not a startling circumstance, for one thing, that the quiet studies of men in laboratories, that the thoughtful developments which have taken place in quiet lecture rooms, have now been turned to the destruction of civilization? The enemy whom we have just overcome had, at his seats of learning, some of the principal centers of scientific study and discovery, and he used them in order to make destruction sudden and complete, and only the watchful, continuous cooperation of men can see to it that science, as well as armed men, are kept within the harness of civilization. Democracy In the rough, democracy is the rule of the mob, the rule of the masses, the rule of the majority, the rule of unintelligence. But even so, it is better than any form of governmental control based upon self-interest, not accepting beneficent autocracy. Humanly bad and socially inefficient as it may be, and has been, democracy alone encloses and fosters the living germ of freedom, self-government. But, during the scant two years that we were at war, no ordinary or accepted definition of democracy could make that term descriptive of the United States. Indeed, under the life-threatening stress of a world war, our great but chaotic nation, in self-preservation, ceased to be a democracy. Transformation in that remarkable war transformation, we certainly did not become an autocracy, even less so of a plutocracy, and least of all a theocracy. 
in fact during this thrillingly interesting time the united states developed into a form of government for which there is no precedent in human experience national industrial management technocracy the characterizing peculiarity which rendered our great country unique during this period of national stress and not only unique but uniquely irresistible was the fact that we rationally organized our national industrial management we became for the time being a real industrial nation this we did by organizing and coordinating the scientific knowledge the technical talent the practical skill and the manpower of the entire community focusing them in the national government and applying this unified national force to the accomplishment of a unified national purpose for this unique experiment in rationalized industrial democracy i have coined the term technocracy it was but an experiment a forced one to meet an exceptionally serious emergency and like most other experimental devices it doubtless was far from perfect in many ways and details still as it seems to me it presented an important suggestion the germ of a novel and significant idea a pioneer idea in the ancient art of government dog eat dog until appropriate economic institutions and instrumentalities are available humanly effective industrial democracy must remain an unrealizable ideal a theory unattainable as a workaday principle of social life and for the efficient distribution of the products of toil upon which human life rests the practical working out of our present efforts in this direction has so far only resulted in a frenzied scramble for wealth place power a brutish instinct scramble in which greed cunning and lust for human mastery are the urges dog eat dog the practical ideal and mystery medievalism law loaded dice and chuckaluck instrumentalities the controlling factors the greedless scientist in this weird social conglomeration how incongruous seems and indeed is the greedless scientist who seeks but to learn to comprehend and to coordinate the laws of nature and who cares not for human mastery in this frenzied scramble for science created wealth what earthly chance has its real creator the scientist practically none none unless he sells himself into virtual slavery unless he debauches his truth-seeking to the interest of those who more practical devote their energy and cunning to the practical enterprise of gaining power by securing control of wealth and yet the united states is characteristically a nation of technologists scientists inventors workers in and utilizers of the raw materials and the forces of nature not only are we instinctively mechanistic but we are by heritage by force of circumstance and by tradition born lovers of personal freedom freedom is our ideal self-government prior to the war our dehumanizing ideal was mechanistic efficiency under its soul-searching stress was born a humanly effective nation our costly lesson with all these considerations before us and our fleeting glance at the possibilities of socially unified skill technology and science how worse than foolish to revert to our pre-war dog-eat-dog practices and practical ideals instead of so doing would it not be well to take to heart the lessons forced upon us at so stupendous a cost of life and human misery would it not be wise statesmanship to experiment further on the lines of direction into which we were forced by the compulsions and stresses of war reconstruction with a national objective the war is over one we are now facing the in reality more stupendous problems of social reconstruction for the war we enlisted conscripted commandeered all our men who by natural aptitude and by personal inclination were adapted to the requirements of war we organized and coordinated them for the intended purpose we trained and exercised their bodies and their minds to meet known and unknown trials we energized their loyalty to the flag the commonweal we stirred their personal devotion to the nation's ideals we enthused their wills to the accomplishment of the unified will of the nation the national objective rationalized industrial democracy no need is there to speak of the result of this unification of national spirit and national purpose the war is over won gloriously won 
as we enlisted all those peculiarly adapted to the destructive functions of war let us now systematically unify those peculiarly adapted to the constructive functions of peace our scientists our technologists our inventors indeed all who by natural aptitude and personal inclination are specially fitted to deal with the social and constructive problems of peaceful industry nationally unify them and their accomplishments for the commonweal let us organize our scientists our technologists our exceptionally skilled let us commandeer conscript enlist their loyalty their devotion their enthusiasm their intelligence their interest their talents their accomplishments for the purposes of peace and the realization of a noble national purpose let us rationalize our industrial democracy public service first we are up against a problem of national reconstruction let us not tinker with feudal details let us nationally reconstruct such a national coordination of science and technology as is here suggested would produce and constitute a living and social life-giving national reservoir of science practical and theoretical a technical army devoted to peace and construction it would constitute a national army from which alone private interests could draw their needed scientific and technical personnel personnel whose loyalty is primarily to the commonweal the nation the nation of which they are honored public servants this is the exact reverse of our present unpatriotic undemocratic order and organization yet such an intimate but subsidiary relation to public service as is suggested would liberate not hamper individual energy and freedom of private enterprise for it would permit the free expression of self-interest unified in the commonweal industrial apex from this coordinated army of science technology and skill should be selected by a process of realized capability and recognized social worth a representative and comprehensive national council of scientists as managing directors our supreme social institution this national council should be the apex of the nation's industrial management it should constitute the leadership of our thus rationalized industrial democracy purpose but this reconstruction revolutionary as it doubtless will appear to many is only preparation for our national task it would indeed make of us an organized human aggregation a unified social machine capable of intelligent self-conscious national life and then comes the question for what worthy purpose have we constructed this huge highly organized human instrumentality this problem a nation no less than an individual unescapably faces the instant it has become really self-determining it is the nation's first its final its only problem the final problem of human existence and this all-important matter every nation like every individual must settle for itself settle between itself and universal rationality the object of the nation's being its conscious rational purpose its national objective fernwald berkeley january nineteen nineteen should the destiny of the nation be left to chance end of technocracy section two Section 3 of Technocracy by William Henry Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Technocracy, Part 3 Ways and Means to Gain Industrial Democracy. Editor's Note In the two preceding essays, Mr. Smith forecasts a new form of government, that which he calls technocracy, national industrial management this article discusses ways and means to develop guide and direct purpose of industrial democracy and so usher in a new commonwealth the author suggests three practical thoughts for economic reconstruction that permitting chance to influence our lives and conditions means ignorance that the flow of time is not reversible the future cannot help the present that cause and effect not whim is the law in nature's processes the editor social structures democracy and autocracy are the antitheses of social organization 
and express opposite underlying principles of human interaction. The structural details of any human contrivance, whether mechanical or sociological, must be in keeping with its underlying idea. Change in principle necessarily entails functional reorganization, reconstruction. Hence ways and means that have proved effective for autocracy, or that long usage has shaped to facilitate its aims and outcomes, must needs be not only workable in, but subversive of democracy. So it will be helpful in our quest, to keep constantly and clearly in mind, the differences between these mutually exclusive notions of government. Autocracy Probably the most radical difference between these two forms of social structures is the assumed sources from which each gets its authority. Autocracy derives its powers from God. This assumption presupposes inherent social distinctions between individuals, occult privileges conferred upon some to control the acts of others. But effectively to control acts makes requisite control of thoughts, for consecutive thought necessarily precedes purposive action. Thus, autocracy implies a God-given right of censorship over other men's physical and mental functioning. Hence, it also presupposes the non-neutrality of nature, cosmic favoritism, for clearly nature's God could not look with favor upon disobedience or lack of submission to the mandates of his authorized agents. A social organization framed upon this general idea implies constructive details, i.e., customs, laws, institutions, economics, comprising, first, a supreme control element, deriving its authority from and responsible only to a super-mundane source. Second, social instrumentalities to enforce obedience, physically coerce human actions, and supernaturally control men's thoughts. Third, a descending series of conferred authority, starting with the God-appointed ruler, and ending with the popular masses, void of rights. Thus, the measure of efficiency in this social system is the absoluteness of control, completeness of enforced obedience in act and subservience in thought, to the God-inspired will of the autocrat and his agents. Democracy Democracy derives its authority from man. This presupposes general intelligence sufficient at least for self-conscious, individual wants and mass purposes, with freedom for their pursuit, Thus it assumes super-mundane non-interference with human wants and purposes, and a rational cosmic order, corresponding or coordinated to human intelligence, in such wise as to be knowable and responsive thereto. A social system based upon this general idea implies constructive details in consonance with, first, the neutrality of nature, second, the inherent individual rights flowing from the facts of rational human existence, third, equality of individual rights. Thus the measure of efficiency in a democracy is to be gauged by the completeness of individual freedom of thought and liberty of action in relation to each other, and of access to nature's stores, resources, and forces, freedom and liberty being based upon rationality, as determined by workability in the production of general human happiness, prosperity, and opportunity for self-development. Autocracy is based upon the idea of the essential manship, i.e., man-likeness, of God and the inherent unrighteousness, irrationality, of man. Democracy is based upon the idea of the essential godship, i.e., godlikeness, of man and the inherent righteousness, rationality, of the universe. Thus we get a clear concept of our chosen social ideal, and from it, indications as to the character of means appropriate to, or discordant therewith. In other words, we have on broad lines, basis for rational economic conventions, adapted to make effective a social system on the basic principles of democracy. Limitations Neither by mutual agreement, nor by legal enactment, nor constitutional provision, nor even as a concession to ancient custom and universal consent, may we make two units and two units constitute five units, being contrary to the facts of nature. For precisely the same reasons we cannot, by any or all of these social expedients, successfully adopt or retain economic devices at variance with the essential principles of democracy. Industrial Democracy Purpose Autocracy and democracy are both merely forms of human organization, group contrivances, social machines, built on different basic ideas or principles, machines to accomplish something. 
a nation no less than an individual that would build or reconstruct without first clearly determining the purpose of the proposed structure would be indulging in a foolish and futile waste of energy but what our national purpose is is quite apart from the present inquiry and indeed it is not the province of an individual but of consensus to determine the ultimate national objective industrial democracy the people of the united states have however agreed and decided upon the idea of the national organization and its proximate character industrial democracy or perhaps this outcome represents the resultant of choice and circumstance be that as it may we are now consciously launched on a career of mechanistic industrial democracy and the aim of the present inquiry is to investigate the functional consistency appropriateness of the working parts of the accepted principle of the national social machine neural nature the greatest and most consequence breeding thought that has ever found lodgment in the human mind is the idea that nature is neutral toward man and in regard to all human concerns the greatest and most consequential human discovery is the orderliness rationality of nature these two concepts are the marvelously fruitful germs from which all modern science has developed and as exact science based upon experimental proof owes its continued development to machines of precision it may with ultimate significance be said that our idea and ideal of human liberty self-government as we today conceive it is one of the many wonderful products of the machine shop our mechanistic industrialism motor impulse of autocracy man's soul is free hence rational liberty is his social motor impulse clearly with an anthropomorphic god interested in human wants wishes purposes and projects and with unlimited power and inclination to meddle in human concerns to help or hinder to make or mar them human freedom of thought would be futile and human liberty of action a farce we have seen that the motor impulse of autocracy is super mundane in origin its initiative is superhuman its means are mysterious occult powers derived from above that privilege maintained by ruthless force and cunning is an essential element and power absolute and humanly irresponsible is its objective these factors therefore present some criteria wherewith to gauge the validity of present economic conventions also to test their appropriateness in a democracy the basis of which is human experience energized by individual human initiative likewise to measure their probable worth in a society in which the powers to do and the opportunity to be are derived from the consensus of free and equal human wills will subject to none but cooperating to facilitate individual and mutual purposes purposes socially unified in the purpose of national will nature non-ethical in the light of modern science human experience shows that nature's dealings with man carry no moral or ethical significance than in the problems of practical mechanics scientifically enlightened experience teaches that humanity alone is ethical or takes account of motives impartially the sun warms and scorches blesses or blasts brings famine and plenty life and death the sea the wind earthquake and torrent and all the forces of nature build and destroy with utter disregard to man or his handiworks his hopes or his faiths his motives or his morals the wondrous mechanism of creative evolution performs its myriad functions no less oblivious to man's existence than are the ponderous machines of man's own devising nature like them fosters or overwhelms with heedless indifference ruthless pitiless appalling to ignorance error and fear but helpful indulgent obedient to knowledge intelligence and courage neither kind nor cruel nor good nor bad impersonal failure in the past with childlike faith we have relied for support and guidance in human affairs upon the assumed beneficence of occult powers upon this basis autocracy is the only conceivable form of social organization yet the autocratic idea and ideal has proven in the opinion of many to be a disastrous failure under modern conditions and we in the united states have decided to try its antithesis democracy but while discarding the old for the new ideal we have most illogically retained substantially unchanged 
the effect of conventions, the ways and means of the old order. And now, with modern science and mechanics, hindered and hampered at all points, by our feudal and inappropriate economic system, we are fighting for national life and democracy against efficiently organized autocracy. Not alone, the autocracy of organized military force, but also the autocracy of systematized and unified financial cunning. Thus the urgent need for scientific reconstruction of our whole social system is multiplied many-fold, if we are to rectify our past sins against reason, and retrieve our pitiful social failure. Modern Dependence on Machinery The life of the ordinary modern man differs, from that of all previous times, in his peculiar dependence upon complicated machinery, machinery over which he exercises no personal control. The manifold activities which in past times depended upon individual muscular effort are now performed by prime movers and power-driven machines, so that the individual man's work and effort is unmeaning and useless, apart from these instrumentalities of life and production. Thus, the United States is one huge mechanistic industrial workshop. The organization of these complex, specialized, power-driven mechanisms, and the sources of power and of the raw materials with and upon which they operate, together with the distribution of the output, are the functions of scientific and technical industrial management. There should be, it would seem, no room or occasion in such an arrangement for chance, mystery, or magic. Old Customs That the average individual prefers old customs to new, helps to account for much that is strange in present conditions, but it fails to explain completely how it happens that occultism has been wholly banished from the machine shop, the social producing element, and remains so conspicuously interwoven in our economics, the social distributive element. It would seem that we are compelled to assume that our deep-seated human instinct of self-interest is the controlling factor in maintaining this incongruous combination of science and occultism. It would seem that the cunning acquisitive instinct of certain exceptionally alert-minded men in the community, taking advantage of the normal preference of the average man for old ways and customs, and his preoccupation in his favorite workings and doings, is employing these ancient and familiar usages to befog and obscure the stealthy diversion of an undue proportion of the community product. If this be so, it should be interesting to glance at the ways and means, the prestidigitatorial bag of tricks by which it is accomplished. Later we will scrutinize them more closely and in greater detail. Money and Credit The basis of mechanics in all its simple and complex expressions are two commonplace elements, the wedge and the lever. The basis of our economic and financial system in all its curious manifestations are also two commonplace elements, money and credit. Here the similarity ends. There is not one ordinary 14-year-old boy in the United States, but who knows and intelligently uses the wedge and lever, and there does not exist a mechanical expert who could reasonably question the practical accuracy of the boy's knowledge regarding these elements of mechanics. Under our present economic usages, customs, and laws, each one of us, man, woman, and child, is compelled, willy-nilly, to use daily and hourly some form of money and credit, and there is not in the world a man who understands either of these economic elements as the boy knows the wedge and lever. Nor is there an economic specialist or financial expert whose attempted explanation of either money or credit, or the functions of either, whose supposed elucidation would not be ridiculed and controverted by a multitude of economic and monetary experts of equal or greater authority. The average man of affairs, lawyer, doctor, editor, tradesman, merchant or mechanic, freely admits his incapacity to understand the mysteries of finance and frankly says, I don't know a damn thing about it. Even bankers and brokers, financiers and economists, whose business it is to deal in and manipulate those most remarkable commodities, will quite frequently make the same honest confession of ignorance. Indeed, the subject is common stock in the jokesmith's workshop. Mystery, Magic failure. In no other department of human interest is so much mystery, confusion, and controversy regarding the basic facts and assumptions, except possibly institutional religion, which avowedly rests upon the miraculous and supernatural. Indeed, 
the parallelism between these two ancient activities is curiously complete both transcend human experience and neither submits to the tests of science weighing measuring cause and effect experimental proof credit like our religious customs our economic system is hoary with age a survival from ancient babylonian customs it rests on assumptions unsanctioned by science its effects are causeless the miraculous supersedes natural causation mystery takes the place of human reason and endless futurity is its heavenly storehouse of all humanly desirable things a thievish process from this miraculous store the wizard of finance with his wonder-working wand credit filches back for a slight present tangible consideration and without the owner's consent the imagined products of imagined future toil of unborn generations of workers a doubly thievish process as black in morals as in magic money while supposedly representing lifeless things that wear out by use money is conventionally endowed by financial magic with everlasting life and also with life's unique function reproduction so money makes money forever and ever for the magician peace superabundance and endless idleness retirement from business is the promised land flowing with milk and honey of economic sainthood the early heaven of finance but never was work more urgent nor idleness less common never was peace more scarce nor strife so universal the labor of future generations has been crazily mortgaged by thievish economic conventions beyond all possibility of redemption in spite of the fact that science and mechanics have multiplied manifold the effectiveness and productiveness of present labor and man's present vocation is social suicide the destruction of wealth and the slaughter of his fellow men a stupendous and tragic record of economic folly and failure the mechanics philosophy success the god of our nursery tradition has been banished from the machine shop and the world of mechanics the result of this courageous spiritual declaration of independence has been our conquest of nature our age of productive industry seemingly a like rending of thought shackles a similar breaking of mental prison bars is needed in the realm of economics when scientific imagination and knowledge of nature's laws are substituted in our economics for chance mystery and magic when the regulation of our nationwide industry is taken out of the hands of quibbling lawyers and nature's forces resources and the mechanical instrumentalities for their transformation into human necessaries and desirables are no longer the playthings of money juggling gamblers and the products of nature and mechanic arts no longer glut the instinctive craving of acquisitive cunning when this economic childish irrationality is sanely substituted by organized science technology and specialized skill coordinated in national industrial management then will begin real civilization the age of social sanity technocracy chance catastrophes the god of chance or god's mysterious providence which permits the killing of a president by a madman the obliteration of a great city by fire the sinking of a huge passenger ship in mid-ocean and a world war are merely misleading euphemisms for human ignorance human improvidence and childish shirking of responsibility social conventions our economic and financial system which by money magic make these chance catastrophes into controlling factors in the distribution of the product of human effort are simply tragic monuments to ignorant superstition mental laziness and criminal folly indeed our whole economic system is so incredibly unscientific so irrational so utterly puerile that were it not for custom-induced mental myopia its glaring absurdities would long ago have sufficed without a world war to shock our mental sense and intelligence into effectivity chance in economics a machine is certain in action and uniform in output because scientific imagination has foreseen and constructive intelligence has provided for the elimination of the chance element the forces which will devastate the results of man's industry through the natural action of an uncontrolled torrential stream with equal unconcern if scientifically directed will make the same countryside teem with human happiness but not by chance in like manner the same natural social forces which make poverty 
wretchedness, and vice, will, with equal unconcern, produce the opposite results, but never by chance. Human institutions founded upon chance merely express man's brute unintelligence. That our economic system makes chance a controlling factor for the distribution of wealth merely shows the persistence of ignorance and that old habits of thought are more compelling than modern intelligence. To legalize chance deliberately is to relinquish our godlike control over the results of nature's processes and thus voluntarily enslave ourselves to ruthless nature and to abandon even our own authority over the outcomes of our own actions. Hence, it would seem, that the first step toward a new and rational economics is a courageous declaration of our freedom from tyranny of the insensate god of chance. Choice When a mechanic has decided upon an idea or principle as the basis of a proposed machine, he has exercised his rational freedom of choice. Regardless of whether his choice is wise or not, in this decision, he has placed definite limits upon the range of subsequent selection in regard to detail instrumentalities. Indeed, he has entered into an implied contract, assumed a rational responsibility, to employ only such means in the construction of his machine as, in accord with universal order, are appropriate to make effective his proposed mechanical contrivance, with failure as the penalty for willful or ignorant error, breach of his implied contract. History demonstrates conclusively that races, nations, civilizations, equally with individuals, are subject to the same rational limitations, are bound by the same responsibility, and incur the same penalty for willful or ignorant error in exercising their human freedom of choice. Our Last Warning The practical difficulties of forestalling the hazards of birth, of death, and of disaster are doubtless great and the problem of eliminating the chance element from our economic system is a man-sized job with a slim probability of complete success but it is reasonably certain that if courage to make the needed change is lacking or if our intelligence is insufficient for the task our social adventure in democracy will prove a tragedy and the world war is i believe our last warning laissez-faire nor may we drift Laissez-faire is lazy fear, cowardly resubmission to the dog-eat-dog jungle law, right of might principle of nature, and of autocracy, from which our modern conscience has revolted. The Mechanic While caution bids us pause, and realize that nature is ruthless in its punishment of ignorance and error, courage reminds us that nature also is infinitely lavish in its rewards for knowledge and intelligence, and courage points to the practical mechanic, as an exemplar and an object lesson for the social constructor. Mechanic versus Nature The mechanic has courageously invaded nature's guarded realm, has accepted her no-quarter terms, and has assumed complete responsibility for his revolt against all the ancient occult powers. He has tacitly assumed that God and nature are supremely and preeminently self-sufficing, that these all-inclusive profundities utterly transcend the utmost limits of his acts or his art, that the plans of God and the mechanic's problems cannot in any wise conflict. He predicates that God and nature are limitlessly competent to care for their own infinite concerns, hence, that his problems involve only what the mechanic wants and not the wants of God. In so far as concerns his art, and with reverence for universal order, which makes his art possible, the mechanic, in effect, says, this I will, this I do, I am the earth god of things, of matter, and of motion. The Mechanic's Achievements And how gloriously has the mechanic made good! Even the most cursory survey of his accomplishments, in manufacture, in transportation, in communication, in reclamation, in power utilization, generally, staggers while it exalts the mind. Has he not, with wheat and corn from eastern steppe and western prairie, and with fresh and wholesome meat from the antipodes, fed the hungry workers of Europe, and brought from the four corners of the earth, materials for their needs, their uses, and their industries? Yes, and from the teeming estuaries of the north, he has served the world's table with dainty fish, and with wine and oil and luscious fruit, from the fertile valleys of the Pacific slope. By his use of nature's forces, he has immeasurably outrivaled imagination's magic carpet, 
transporting by his mechanisms untold millions of work-weary families from cramped and life-worn areas to the free spaciousness of many wide-scattered edens of plenty there to found empires and more he has bound these broadcast settlements in bonds of mutual help with space negating bands of steel and steam and on the one-time pathless ocean he has marked out highways with light and life of swift moving commerce till in the uttermost ends of the earth friend greets friend as though but a mile from home seas no longer separate nor continents divide for man now walks with man as face to face across the soundless void as with a broom he has swept sullen ocean back to its deeps and bared netherlands fertile plains and with dike and mill and pump he holds his prize secure from angry wave and wind and shifting sand a prize indeed a rich and prosperous country of towns and villages of farms and homesteads all interlaced with road and rail and placid waterway a hive of human industry a kingdom snatched from ocean's grasp in torrid egypt too he has tamed the turgid nile to flood the desert sands and made thereof a nation's granary he has moved mountains split continents harnessed niagaras to his machines subdued the land triumphed over the sea and now seeks dominion of the air and east and west and north and south he has sluiced and swept with giant streams the high piled gravels and ripped and smashed and ground to powder fine as from the mills of the gods mountains of crystalline quartz and dredged and ploughed and sifted the frozen arctic tundra to tear from the reluctant earth its golden treasure for counters wherewith to play man's worldwide commerce game the economist's failure all this stupendous output of human experience human reason human industry rivaling creation itself is in startling contrast with our worldwide tragedy the outcome of our worldwide economics a contrast doubly significant significant in the entire absence of chance of mystery of magic from the work of the mechanic and again as expressing the practical extremes of glorious success and of failure most tragic selective rejection the human mind like the body can advance only step by step from the solid ground of the known and tested to the doubtful footing of the unfamiliar human progress is like adventuring through a morass of ignorance toward a far distant goal with disaster the penalty for every false step in the great adventure called human progress the occult has proved a will-o'-wisp guide notwithstanding all the stupendous accomplishments which characterize productive industry and the present era as the age of mechanics the process which has brought it all about is the same step by step proof by experiment scientific method we can think of the new and unknown only in terms of the old and familiar still errors detected and fallacies perceived are guides for inventive synthesis construction selection is but a process of inverted rejection so having determined that our ideal social structure is the antithesis of the autocratic ideal we may with confidence assume that the characteristic elements of autocracy are inappropriate for our purpose thus by a process of selective rejection we should arrive at economic expedience more in harmony with our social ideal democracy versus anarchy universal order is the keynote of modern science and upon this orderliness of nature scientific thinking is based hence the much abused phrases human liberty and human freedom cannot imply anarchy or chaos i e disorder liberty means absence of a rational restraint freedom of thought can have but self-imposed limitations social freedom simply means liberty for rational individual activity tending to the accomplishment of community purpose national self-determination when a nation exercising its freedom of choice discards autocracy and selects democracy as its social principle it cannot successfully retain the working elements of the discarded social organization if it is to survive it must adopt ways and means and methods of life in consonance with its chosen principle our feudal experiment the united states like a novice in mechanics has seemingly undertaken the feudal experiment of building an industrial democracy out of the functional elements of predatory autocracy 
the natural result is noise, friction, and heat. And worse, a dangerously large proportion of our energy is wastefully expended, in constant readjustment to keep the outfit running, and to prevent its pounding itself into scrap. Practically the whole of our economic and financial system is a leftover from the days when absolutism and privilege were universally accepted ideas and ideals, and when magic causation was an unquestioned fact. Quite naturally, our economic customs, conventions, and laws are in keeping with those antiquated assumptions. Substantially our economics is a vestige, and as with other vestiges, like our veriform appendix, it is now functionally useless, and frequently causes much unnecessary pain and trouble, which sooner or later may end in tragedy. Not all bad. While, in the foregoing, there is no real cause for pessimism, there is even less reason for happy-go-lucky optimism. Mentally reviewing this matter, there appear several implications which stand out clearly as definite practical suggestions for economic reconstruction. Suggestions for Reconstruction First, that chance means ignorance. The elimination of even the crudely obvious chance factors from our laws, customs, and economic conventions would do away with much rank injustice in our social functioning. Second, that the onward flow of time is not reversible. The future cannot help the present. A clear appreciation and practical application of this seemingly axiomatic proposition would go far to remedy the grosser evils of capitalistic economics and strip money and credit of their conventionally endowed time-reversing magic. In every physical human accomplishment, there are involved but three factors or elements. Raw material, nature's free gift. Human time, human energy. Every product, food, clothing, housing, transportation facilities, or what not, represents a definite amount of past human time and past human energy, gone beyond recall. Neither by ghostly hands, nor by flibber-gib financial conventions, can future work or future product be yanked back into the present, to be used for present purposes, or to meet present emergencies, even if self-respect and common honesty did not suffice, to prevent such inexcusable camouflaged robbery of the helpless, the quintessence of taxation without representation. Third, that cause and effect not whim, is the order of nature's processes. Science shows us that so far as man is concerned, nature is infinite possibilities, possibilities realizable in terms of individual and collective purposes. We can, if we will, providing our aims and objectives are in accord with the rational order of nature. It is only in purposive action that human freedom, self-determination, is expressed. An aimless man or a purposeless nation is an equally insignificant fragment of raw material in nature's evolutionary and devolutionary processes. But, knowledge of nature and of nature's laws, coordinated by human intelligence in rationally purposive actions, have all of nature's infinite potentialities and stupendous forces as tools to facilitate accomplishment. Purposive Coordination Obviously the control of our great national workshop, the United States, should not be in the hands of selfish Mr. Acquisitive Cunning, who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, facile only in getting something for nothing, and whose highest social ideal is to buy cheap and sell dear, but, in reason, in common horse sense, our purposive industrial democracy should be guided and directed by nationally organized and coordinated specialists in all the branches of skill, technology, and science which are involved in its social life, and requisite to the successful accomplishment of its great national objective. Fernwald, Berkeley, February 1919 Is the onward flow of time reversible by human convention? End of Technocracy, Section 3